Hi, I'm Shannon Simons and I'm out in the estuary where my kids call it the end of the world. Um, and so hopefully it'll be quiet and I won't be disturbed. Um, so I am the author of Safe House and Finding Hope and they are the Grace James story. Safe House is my first novel and I've gotten permission from Cedar Fort, the publisher, to read it to you and at the end of each chapter chat a little bit about what I learned as an advocate um, and about how you might uh, be able to speak to or work with survivors in your world of domestic violence. Um, Grace James is an advocate. Officer Joe Hart is somebody she thinks is very nice and works with. Uh, Emily and Kelly are victims, as is Emily's daughter Amber, of domestic violence. Um, in, in the book, everybody lives in a small town in Mechanicum, which is very close to the size of the town that I live in and that the end of the world is in, um, Seaside, Oregon. You know, there's probably six to 8,000 of us that live here year round. Uh, feels a little bit like high school. We know each other and when we see each other, we're familiar faces even if we don't know names. And um, you love each other and support each other. People are three-dimensional. Characters in my books are three-dimensional. Even abusers are three-dimensional. Um, so, here we are. Uh, Burke has walked away from his release program. He has assaulted Amber and a young boy at school named Alan and a vice principal, Mr. White, stepped in. And um, that was kind of terrifying for a moment and hard for Amber. So now we're at the police station. Families. Hart settled his witness in the small interview room at the Nicanicum police station. He excused himself and went out to talk to Iron Pot about calling DSAT. Iron Pot and Sergeant Henry had brought Burke Anderson into the booking room. They had removed the cuffs, taken property, booking photos, and printed him. Iron Pot looked at all of Burke's property, including his belt and shoes, and put them in a property locker. He looked at the electronic monitoring ankle bracelet. A lot of good it did, he thought. It was put in the jail, it put on by the jail, and was supposed to signal his system when he left his home or designated areas. All through the process, Burke arrogantly demanded his phone call. Finally, before putting him in the cell, Iron Pot offered him the phone. He dialed, Burke's, he dialed Burke's attorney and waited while he was forced to leave a message on an answering machine. Being generous, Iron Pot let him call his father. The foul language bounced out of the phone and circled the room. Iron Pot put his finger on the button and hung up. Burke looked like a beaten puppy. Iron Pot led him into the holding cell to await transportation to the county jail, and then he met Hart in the hall by dispatch. Judy, watch him for suicide, Iron Pot told the dispatcher. He's pretty down. I think he's way too stupid and selfish to do us that favor, Hart said. Watch it, cynic. You'll get what you ask for. Believe me, you don't want it on your watch. Hart smiled sheepishly, knowing Iron Pot was right. He was a cynic. Do you think we should call DSAT? Hart asked. It's not a typical domestic. Yes, but it's the same victim as last night. I don't know if Grace got too far with our victim, Emily, other than getting her to go in for stitches. It would give her a second chance to talk to Emily when Amber has to go home. I've been thinking we need to call Child Welfare and get Child Protective Services investigator on this, and even though they don't do much for teens. But we do have a nine-month-old and a seven-year-old in the home. That's true. Grace was going to do the dinner dishes when, Bye, Mom, was called loudly as everyone left for church. At last, she thought, as she had a quiet moment at the sink doing dishes. Even though she loved being where her family, here with her family, every once in a while, she loved, she was looking for, she loved a good book or time to paint. Right now, she was looking forward to both. An unfinished painting was on the easel in the living room, and a book on tape called her name like chocolate cake. Work broke into her thoughts, and she found herself thinking about Emily. Drying her hands, oh, we might have company, and they're pretty loud. Drying her hands. She checked her pockets to make sure she had her cell, cell phone with her. It rang, and the wind went out of her sails. This is Grace. NPD has requested a DSAT worker meet at the meet officers at the station. All right, she sighed. I'm there. Thanks. Ending the call, she walked towards the door, looking longingly at the canvas on the easel as she slipped on her shoes. The call from the child welfare worker came soon after they were paged. Hart stopped interviewing and went to the squad room to answer the phone. 
Hello, this is Child Welfare. Who am I speaking with? This is Officer Hart from the Decanican Police Department. Officer Hart, you called. This is Risa. Oh, hi, Risa. Hart knew Risa. She was 50, married without children. She wasn't a soft touch. Last night, officers responded to a domestic at the Anderson House. The district attorney sent us the reports. We staffed it this morning and put it in a five-day response. Meaning? Meaning our investigator met with the family. We'll meet with the family in five days. Well, we've had another incident involving the 17-year-old, Amber, tonight. You know we don't do much with teens. She asked him like he was an idiot. Hart knew the police policy was that teens could defend themselves, call the police, or run away. Foster care rarely worked, and kids usually ran if they were not in care voluntarily. I know, but tonight he assaulted Amber. Is she an unruly teen? What did Amber do? Does it matter? Yes, it changes everything. No, she's not unruly. She seems almost meek. So you don't know? Not yet. Did you arrest him? Yes, not only on assault, but on a violation of his release agreement. Perfect. He's not going anywhere. We'll staff it in the morning. Forward me your report. Hart hung up and turned to Iron Pot, who was in his cubicle typing reports. Iron Pot, you were right. Child welfare? He asked, pointing at the phone. Yes. They going to do anything? Iron Pot cocked his eyebrow and smiled as if in anticipation. All right, you were right. It was a big fat promise to staff it. Well, that's something, Iron Pot said. A speaker interrupted their conversation. It was Judy and dispatch. D sat to meet with officers. They looked at each other. I hope it's Grace, Iron Pot said. It's not that I don't like the others, but she knows the case. Hart buzzed the lobby's magnetic doors. When Hart saw Grace open the door, he broke into a grin. Miss me, uh, miss us, honey? Hart asked. I have been calling people all day, trying to get them to beat each other up on your shift so we could spend more time together. I'm your biggest fan. If only he knew, she thought. And a smile spread across her face. Do I need a stocking order? You'll have to come see me tomorrow so I can help you fill it out. It's a plan. So what brings me out on my broom again? Amber Anderson, Hart said, his face becoming serious. Amber? Grace couldn't place the name, but it sounded familiar. Burke and Emily's daughter. Oh, the puzzles began moving towards each other. She knit her brows and asked, what happened? Hart filled Grace in. Is the surfer okay? Yeah, he's got a bloody nose, bumps and scrapes. You got photos? He nodded. We're in the middle of a taped interview. Oh, can I just listen and do my work when you're done? I called child welfare. He looked at her to see what she would think. Good. What did they say? That's a five-dayer. Grace shook her head in disbelief. I hate the thought of those kids in that house if he bails out again. I don't think he can, but you know our jail's release system. That's an even scarier thought, Grace said. They looked at each other and both shook their heads. Due to overcrowding, when the jail hit capacity, usually two or three inmates were let out early per day. Hart led Grace to the interrogation room. She expected to see Amber, but was thrown by seeing Brother White and Alan. They both went to her church. Ignoring her for a minute, ignoring them for a minute, she held her hand out to Amber, who looked, her, looked up with wary eyes. Hi, Amber. I am so sorry. I'm Grace. I met with your mom last night. I understand you had a bad day, or is that an understatement? Do you have to call my mom? Grace looked over her shoulder at Hart. Hart sat down facing Amber and said, as I told you, Amber, because you're a minor, I have to notify your mother. We'll wait a minute, though, if that's all right. I'd like to finish the interview. Amber nodded. Grace turned to White and Alan. You're missing church ball, and you must be the surfer hero, hero Alan, because it can't be Brother White. Brother, Hart thought. He hadn't heard someone called that since he was a kid. Alan must be a member of Grace's church, too. You know each other? Hart asked Grace. She made a deadpan face. Never saw them before in my life. Amber actually laughed, and Alan stood up and gave Grace a hug as she held her arms out to him. Hi, Grace, he said. Hart looked surprised. Alan just lives at my house with my brother and Esther sometimes. Whenever there's pizza or water in the hot tub, we go to the same church, and he's the same age as my bratty brother. Not you two. Let me see your hands, all of you, Hart said seriously. They all held out their hands. Three rings. Hart shook his head. Do you have a decoder for those? Amber looked confused. I'll explain later, Alan said to her. Time to get back to work. Hart reined them in. 
Grace looked at Hart's handsome face and wondered now that he knew she was a nice, church-going girl. Would his interest in her fade away? Vice Principal White had finished his interview first and gone home. When Iron Pot was calling parents, he joined after when Iron Pot was done calling parents, he joined Hart, Allen, Amber, and Grace in the interview room. Amber was just signing a written statement when Iron Pot returned. Alan, I called your parents and they want to come down. They're on their way, Iron Pot told Alan. Amber visibly tensed. What about my mom? Amber asked. She said it's okay for you to drive yourself home. She said the baby's asleep and you don't have a sitter. Your neighbor Martha wasn't home. Oh, Amber said, looking worried. I, I left my car at the cove. I can take Amber back to her car, Alan quickly volunteered. You better talk to your folks first, Alan, Amber Pot told, Iron Pot told him. I can take you home, Amber, Grace offered. Thanks, but if Alan could, that would be great. Amber looked down at the floor, and Grace realized by the color in her cheeks her choice of drivers was, more, was about more than the ride. How about if you and Alan, you go with Alan, and I go talk to your mom before you get there, Grace said. She's going to be mad at me for getting my stepdad in trouble again. Maybe I can help. You don't, you didn't do anything wrong. Grace looked at Amber, wishing somehow Amber would trust her. She thinks it's my fault. I know, Grace agreed, surprising Amber, but I'm sure it's not your fault. And I really want to talk to her. Okay, Amber reluctantly agreed. Hart stood up. I'll check to see if your parents are in the lobby, Alan. Hart left the interview room and then came back with a smile on his face. Alan, your fan club's in the lobby, he said. Thanks. Come on, Amber. I'll introduce you to my parents. Oh, I, I don't know, Amber said. Ellen ignored her response, took her hand, and let her out. Grace followed. The lobby was filled with children and two adults who all called Alan's name and gathered around him like a brood of chicks around a mother hen. Alan took the baby out of his mother's arms like it was natural. Everyone was talking at once. His mother was really short, Grace noticed. She shined like Alan. She had a pretty freckled round face with sunny light brown hair and was wearing what looked like gardening clothes. His dad was tall like Alan. He look, they looked a lot alike, handsome, dark hair, clear skin, blue eyes, and long, lean muscles. His dad was definitely a working man and was covered with sawdust. Without saying a word, he walked over to Alan, wrapped his arms around him and patted him on the back and began leading him and the brood toward the door. Alan stopped his father and turned towards Amber while the baby pulled his hair. Dad, Mom, this is Amber, he said while his mother examined his nose and a few scratches on his face, clucking her tongue over the blood on his shirt. Everyone's attention turned to Amber, who froze with her hands pulled back in her sleeves and her hood over her messy hair. Her eyes were filled with anxiety, looking like a frightened bird meaning ready to fly. Oh, Amber, I am so sorry to hear what happened, Alan's mother said, while she naturally put her arm around Amber, touched her face, and began to examine her. Are you hurt? she asked Amber. No, Mrs. You can call me Clarine. Grace was pretty sure that would be hard for Amber. Grace interrupted and introduced herself. Mrs. Johnson, I'm Grace. I work at the Family Crisis Center and I go to church with Alan. I just wanted to tell you that your son is a real life hero. Grace said as she took Mrs. Johnson's hand and shook it. Alan's neck and face flushed patchy red. Mr. Johnson's eyebrows rose and the rest of the children actually stopped talking to listen. Mm, Mr. Johnson said, being interpreted as tell me more. Grace looked at him. Mr. Johnson, Amber was in the process of being assaulted when Alan stepped in to protect her. You have a lot to be proud of. Mrs. Johnson was beaming. Alan looked at the floor and Amber still hadn't moved. Hmm, Mr. Johnson answered, being interpreted as agreement and pride. Grace turned to Alan. You are very lucky today, dear. Next time call the police, but thank you. I know I'll see you around. Call me if you need anything. She handed Mr. Johnson her card. Turning to look at Amber, Grace said, Remember what I told you, Amber. This is not your fault. With that, Grace squeezed Amber's thin arms and excused herself to drive to Emily's house. So, a couple of things. Um, you know, you can see when they're checking Burke in that um, he's still very attached to his parents. And that was something that uh, I saw pretty often there was somebody to bail out abusers, but also that um, what Dr. Evan Stark calls low self-esteem uh, leads sometimes to that controlling and battering personality. 
also child welfare. You know, lots of things change. Um, ankle bracelets will change. Release agreements will change. And child welfare, I think, tries. They lack the resources for what they're being asked to do a lot. Uh, I know that in our small county, as small as we are, we got a, an amazing grant that allowed us to co-locate an advocate in the office to work with mothers. You know, as advocates, we have to keep confidentiality. That means we can't talk to child welfare. Um, we aren't able to discuss things anymore. That's new. That just happened a few years ago to give parents safe places to digest what's happening in their homes and to make decisions that will be protective of their children. You know, they are often used as um, a weapon by abusers or um, a threat. You know, you need to get this together or we're calling child welfare. Or I will tell child welfare what a bad mother you are. Uh, some abusers will even get victims to do things like um, use drugs with them or do something that they wouldn't normally do and then threaten to tell their family or to call child welfare. Um, child welfare can be a support and it, it, it can be the thing that keeps women from coming forward and men. Um, we need to be safe to talk. We need to be safe to report. Victims of abuse need, need safe places. In the state of Oregon, advocates are exempted from mandatory reporting. And we are that safe container now. That has not always been the case and was not the case at the time that I wrote this book. Um, so know that uh, being a victim of domestic violence does not make you a bad mother. And oftentimes victims do extreme and extraordinary things to protect their children. Uh, Amber, as you can see, is a teen already is taking responsibility for what's happening in her home. I can't count the number of times I heard small children, you know, five-year-olds, 11-year-olds, seven-year-olds tell me, I tried to stop the abuser. I tried to get in the middle of them. I tried to protect my parent. Um, you know, kids don't realize that they aren't Superman and that they could get really hurt in being in the middle. But Amber does realize that just by talking to the police that she has taken great, great risk for herself and for her family because you just kind of kick the hornet's nest, so to speak. Um, so that's it for this week. And I apologize for missing last week. I was organizing Authors for Freedom. If you didn't see it, look it up for next year. I volunteer for Operation Underground Railroad to support survivors um, and to end and help them rescue child sex trafficking victims. Uh, I also had to take a little corona test because I kind of got sick this week. So forgive me for being late. Forgive me for missing a week. And uh, this is the estuary. So let me give you a quick panorama. This is the Nicanicum River and it feeds into the ocean. And right now the tide is way out and you can see Gearheart, beautiful Gearheart across the river. So thanks for joining me.